Well, nothing, nothing. They turn around to people nothing, and nothing. said, Oi! We're fucking brilliant. You'll either <laughs> listen to us or fuck off. And their attitude was, oh, fuck that, come on. And that were, that were right at the time because there wasn't anything. I think a lot of young people had, had accepted conservative rule and doll culture and uh, daytime telly and uh, smoking spliff for a living and going to the odd football match as uh, that was it. You know, I think Britain was dead in the 80s. Terrible. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely Synthetic terrible. Synthetic fucking rubbish. It that was, was that when I were growing up in the 80s, like, and it was, what the fuck's this all about? I think it was with ecstasy, really. I think that it was the new posh designer drug, you know, and um, once it once it was very exciting when it first happened, you know. Going to the Hacienda and and literally listening to this music, which was fucking unspeakably rubbish. And then you had an E, and it was like listening to fucking classical music. We get all over like doing it, you know. Travel about and it's top, better than working in it. You know, that's the way I look at it. Does everybody know that we're doing an Oasis tribute band? Or are you just going to tell them how good it is? Who? Um, you. <laughs> I said, tell us about your tribute band. Oh, it's it's top. It's oh, great, on, it's man. great. We'll go on, I'll leave it's it It's an Oasis you, tribute band called Wonderwall. And it's good, I'll go there now. Yeah, it's good, carry on, Dean. No, you're all right, you Self carry on, man. Don't you fucking interrupt me again. I'm just lucky to have the part of Noel. Because he say, finds it much easier to act like a twat. Festivals. People just didn't give a fuck, you know. Like like rock and roll star, cocaine cube, live forever, cigarettes and alcohol. They're probably the three songs that sum up the nineties. A lot of fun. Ambition. I don't think really anyone was thinking about the consequences. That's more my thing. I like to watch. Sunny day, the sunshine looked daydlow because of all the chemicals in the air. There were thousands and thousands of teenagers there, and I'd never seen so many kids um, smoking so much dope and taking so many drugs. People were really, really stoned on weed and also on ecstasy as well, so it was a very sort of Return of the 60s hallucinogenic type crowd. It was a shit gig, but it was a fantastic, the, the, you know, from, from a technical point of view, the, the wind was blowing the sound all over the fucking place. I don't think I got to hear one of the songs properly, but that wasn't the point. The point was it was all them people there. Spike Island was, it, that was the blueprint for my group. We were then going to become the biggest band in the world. And the Stone Roses, their impact and that, that gig stretches so far beyond the gig itself and, and the music. You know, the Stone Roses need never have played a note at that gig. 
The job's already done when the people are there, do you know what I mean? Spike Island was a good feeling. It was this feeling of space. It was a feeling of freedom. After having been locked up by 11 years of a Conservative government. Inquiry gets underway. Senior officers have already said there was evidence of anarchists. Ladies and gentlemen, we're leaving Downing Street for the last time after 11 and a half wonderful years, and we're very happy that we leave the United Kingdom in a very, very much better state than when we came here 11 and a half years ago. When we were making Blue Lines, it was the beginning of that, the post thatcher thing, it was the beginning of the self, you know. It was all about self and nothing about community at all. I never felt it like British, you know, I mean, everyone involved in making those records came from total, di you know, totally different sort of ethnic backgrounds, you know. Jamaican, Barbadian, half Italian for me, you know, English. There was never this kind of British feel to it. It always struck me about most British music, in, in hip-hop and rock, there was this kind of a weird lean towards Americanism in everyone's accents and their voices. And we never had the urge to do that, we always wanted to sound ourselves. And it wasn't the urge to sound British or sort of like a sort of twee or kind of like, you know, it's just trying to be ourselves, trying to use references that meant something to us that people would get, you know, pick up on. Well, what happened after Spike Island is that the Stone Roses completely fucked it up. The Roses were the group who were going to break through and make it, and they didn't because they lost their nerve. And so um, there was a hole there um, within that particular aspect of pop rock culture, and that was very quickly filled by Nirvana and what became known as grunge. Load up on drugs, kill your friends as far as you need to defend. She's overjoyed, self Nirvana were incredibly forceful and incredibly powerful, and one of the greatest rock groups of all time. The pendulum went back to America. There's always this tick tock tick-tock thing between the US and the UK. Within the UK, the US often does not give a toss about the UK. So within the UK, you suddenly had this grunge invasion, and actually, the only decent group really were Nirvana. starting to dominate the music industry in this country, rather like they are now. Um, and you know, Nirvana and Pearl Jam and bands like that were just sort of like cleaning up everywhere. And I think it was a groundswell of movement between, well, I mean, certainly I, I wanted, I liked English music, so I started representing a lot of English bands. Blur started drinking here, and uh, Morrissey lived around here at the time, and he used to come in here as well. Um, Pulp and Jarvis used to come and drink here and uh, sway to their interviews here. Menswear formed in here, and uh, Elastico signed their deal in here. Um, famously on a matchbox of that. So yeah, there was a lot of you know, significant bands were here.
Select magazine wanted to do a feature about um, British bands, five of them actually at the time, which were Suede, Pulp, um, Denim, you know, we came out of Felt, The Auteurs, and Synthetian. And three of those bands were represented my company, so they obviously sort of came through me to sort of try and set it up. They ended up putting up a picture of Brett on the front with a Union Jack behind him, which was not a great idea really. Um, and it, I think it was coming out of like, this is something that is uniquely ours. Preference for the habitual voyeur of what is known as a morning suit can be avoided if you take a route straight through what is known as John Scott Brewer's group. He gets intimidated by the dirty pigeons. They love a bit of him. Who's that gut lord marching? You should cut down on your pork life, mate. Get some exercise. It all started when we were at our second tour of America. And I uh, just became very disillusioned with uh, what I was seeing, I suppose, because we travelled on a bus and we went to some pretty obscure places. I got quite a... Uh, it was quite insightful. Uh, and I started to sort of uh, make a lot of connections between home and America. All these American things we embraced. And it's not about Plastic mouldings and obesity and uh, money for nothing. And... Um, Fun pubs really annoyed me. They just rip everything out and then replace it with plastic. I saw it come coming over and I started to write songs about it. It became terrifying. We went up to collect our fourth Brit. I think it was kind of dawning on us that um, everyone had taken it all very seriously and. Uh, I'd really missed the point of what the record was about. I mean, you did grow up in the East End. I mean, did you? I mean, a lot of people I don't believe I grew up in the East End. Well, a lot of people slagged you off for being some sort of fake, sort of Mabney Cockney, didn't they? I was what I was. I was born in Whitechapel Hospital and I lived uh, in Leytonstone until I was nine. I went to the same school as Jonathan Ross. Yeah, and then I moved to, to move to Colchester and I felt completely like a fish out of water. It was a, a, a almost exclusively white community. It was pretty racist still. Um, they'd they'd, they'd, um, they'd taken to, to Thatcher's dream and they'd really gone for it. But the price of it was just sort of, uh, I felt it was too much, really. And I, and, I, and I felt very out of place. The way the sort of, the environment was just fucked up. And the colour and the sort of vibrancy of the countryside was destroyed. Uh, and within a couple of years, and, and Thatcher, uh, there were just this, this, just this kind of urbanisation of, you know, I was literally, it literally was field, fields I was playing in one year were, were housing estates in there. Yeah, we went on tour with Blur, the Park Life Tour, and just what I remember most about it, there was one gig about halfway through, and it was the Shepherd's Bush Empire. And I remember... We'd done our support slot. I remember watching Blur on stage, and there's three tiers of balconies, and watching them literally sort of moving up and down, and they were jam-packed with 15, 16, 17, 18-year-old kids. And this was a generation that had only known one establishment, one order. It literally, sort of, the whole lot of them had grown up under Thatcherism and, and beyond. And there was a sense of kind of excitement that something was changing, perhaps. Perhaps this music was foreshadowing something else. I think the thing about Parklife, it did capture that sort of, um, that sense of freedom that you finally got when you left the fifth form. 
and you were just sitting around in parks drinking cider and booting footballs at each other. I remember the last the night we finished the first ever edition of Loaded. When I finished, I put boys and girls on and danced around the office. It was exciting and it was at edge. And I think I remember listening to that record and then the f every every desk in the office had been cleared because we were moving up to a bigger office. And I was just about to tip my desk into a, a crate and the phone went. And it was somebody from the Daily Express saying, had I heard whether or not Kurt Cobain was dead? Fans of the American rock band Nirvana have been mourning the death of the group's lead singer, Kurt Cobain. The self-confessed... ...last month addict. shot himself at his Seattle home. A suicide note was found beside his body. What happened with Kurt Cobain's suicide was that there was this vacuum and the music industry and the media in industries abhor a vacuum. And Oasis came along at just the right time. At that time, it was just Phil Collins and all these boring people and boring bands. And who were playing big gigs, but it was like, you know, you've got nothing to say. You don't look like rock stars, you look like dicks in tights. You are like someone off a pantomime, you know what I mean? And, it's time for some real lads to get up there and take charge. And I think that's what we did. Didn't like music then. Just played football and come in late for me to see and knocked on people's doors and ran off and ran through people's back gardens and pinched them. What sort of things would you pinch? Clothes off the washing line. If I thought it looked pretty cool, I thought I'd have that. Mountain bikes, anything. Lawn mowers. You used to pick lawn mowers? And sell them. The weed. You would want to write about your daily life living in Manchester in a fucking block of flats, smoking shit weed, doing nothing, you know. Um, my ones are all about just getting out of the city and, I don't know, living a better life, really. I wrote it in um, India House on Whitworth Street in Manchester, flat 47, fourth floor. It's where all the beautiful people in Manchester used to live. But I wrote it in... Uh, my bedroom, and I'd just been listening to um, Exile on Main Street, and the melody from the first line goes, Maybe I don't really want to know, and that's from May the Good Lord Shine a Light on You. I think it only took a, an evening to write, played it to the band the next day, and I think the day after that we played it in a gig at Manchester Hop and Grape. <laughs> They were their own nation state, it was their own principality of oasis. They didn't belong to anybody. They were completely unself conscious. Um, they were incredibly volatile. You never knew what they were going to say next. They really just didn't give a shit. They didn't give a shit what people thought about them. And it was very much from the gut. And I think we'd waited a very long time to have uh, British pop stars that were like that again. And suddenly two came at once. <laughs> Give it up for Oasis, making their TV debut with Supersonic. It's 
huge. You know, by London standards at that time, we didn't have any restaurants really that you went to in that way. So uh, I remember going in there thinking, my God, this, is, this must cost a fortune. And it was beautiful. It was all art deco and very much my style and good use of color. And, and everyone just felt this optimism from that, that point. Everyone thought anything's possible because it worked. something going on. A new generation had come of age and they had grown up loathing and despising American mass culture um, when it came to music, movies, TV, um, computer games. It was all American and I think, I think a generation of Brits who came of age in the mid-90s really resented this. You know, they felt a kind of uh, a nationalistic resentment of the fact that uh, America enjoyed this unchallenged cultural hegemony, And consequently, that there emerged this kind of protest movement, if you like, this new music, this, these new fashions, which were more anti-American, and they were British in a slightly caricatured way. That, that was enough for, for kind of the world to go nuts for a little while about London's second coming. Confidence was something that in the past we'd let, you know, left to Americans. And the Americans have tremendous confidence, but not much talent. And it just seemed that, you know, all those sentences, all those discussions you've ever had, like, wouldn't it be great if? Well, that's what happened in the 90s. If happened. Aces are here to see you, and they're going to play the first ever TV performance of their brand new song. It's the best song around. It is Some Might Say. Oasis were on top of the pops. I think Some Might Say had gone into number one, and I remember watching them, and I just cried. I thought, something is really changing here. It must have been early May because they just had the council elections and the Tories finally had got trounced. They were really trounced. Somehow, by accident, by design, somebody captures the mood of the moment with a song. And that, to me, was the making of Oasis. As Britain approaches the end of the century, we have been with the same masters now for 18 years. We still have the talent, skills, and inventiveness that we've always had, probably more so. But in a rapidly changing world, we seem somehow to have lost our sense of purpose. <laughs> Now, someone has emerged who is determined to give it back to us. I'll tell you what surprised me was the way New Labour explicitly aligned themselves, especially with music. 
New Labour, by definition, uh, was very young. I mean, Tony Blair was young. I mean, there was a, a guy who played rock music when he was at university rather than traipsed along on demonstrations and, you know, supported worthy causes. I mean, Were you familiar with his band, Ugly Rooms? I, I don't know his band, Ugly Rooms. I'm afraid I was more boring. Uh, we were at Oxford at the same time, but I was sort of tedious, sort of political anorak type. Labour has come home to you, so come home to us. Labour's coming home. 17 years of hurt never stopped us dreaming. Labour's coming home. Tony was trying to generate a new politics, a freshness in politics. He needed ways to symbolise that freshness, you know, doing headers with Kevin McKeegan or, you know, talking to Noel Gallagher or, or whatever it was. Uh, he went out into the country to establish Labour's credentials, to create a connection between the new politics that we were trying to create and the country uh, as a whole. Oi! There are seven people in this room tonight who are giving a little bit of hope to young people in this country. That is me, our kid, Bonehead, Quigsy, Alan White, Alan McGee and Tony Blair. And if you've all got anything about you, you get up there and you shake Tony Blair's hand, man. He's a man. Power to the people! Britain had been so uptight and so under the cosh for so long. Uh, and at war with itself, and at war with its identity. You know, the 80s was when Britain stopped being Great Britain and stopped living that myth that we were some great state. And the outsiders came in through the 90s, and um, it was their turn. Exciting time. It's like reinvention of what was back in the '60s and and punk. Maybe it was it was maybe it was reminiscing a bit of the past, but with a forward vision. English tradition is fantastic. You know, I love the pomp and snobbery of it all. And so to take that and create something new and modern is a, for me just the way forward. had these, these times where, uh, you know, Britain was exciting, London was exciting, and I think this gave us an excuse to say it's exciting again. And it, and it just happened at a time when there was a lot going on. You know, um, I was doing my bit on the road, McQueen was doing his bit in Paris, Geigers were doing what they were doing around the world. It was a great time. kind of Jaws element to it. You just go, right, I'll take that thing that frightens you from Jaws and I'll just do that with it and put it there. I mean, all I had was an idea that I wanted it to be big enough to eat you in and something that could frighten you, you know, and not a painting and, you know, not a sculpture and not a light box. I just wanted this thing that had that actual, you know, could create that actual fear. But then I suppose, you know, in, there was something in those times that made everybody feel it was possible to go that bit further and larger. We never had an idea that we were going to make paintings and wait for somebody to come along. It just, you know, it just wasn't like that. It was like, we couldn't wait. Which is like, you know, we just said, come on, let's just get a building. 
go out there and like do it and get because it's, it's like the works the things that we're making didn't function unless they were actually in a space and with people looking at them now underpants are art and i remember the other daily star standing in front of work, the fish piece with a bag of chips you know and you get all that stuff and it's like the people it's like people don't realize that you know they think god that art's so sensational when really it's this stuff in the newspapers which is a lot more sensational when you actually go there you know, I mean, like the cow and calf cut in half, there's something really sort of sad and quiet and tragic about it. When you actually see it again, the same with the shark, you know. But then, you know, we do have a few uh, heads blown off and things in there. We're not averse to that kind of stuff. Benny Hill, wasn't it? Well, that's what I did when I asked to do it. I put on the thing, I wrote very Benny Hill. That was the whole script for it. And we did it. I'd get Damon cut out a load of shots from it, which was really bad because he didn't want to alienate his female fans. We had like, I had uh, Joe Guest in a nurse's uniform running on the spot, like big in and out cleavage shots. And I think, in a way, for me, that kind of made it. I mean, it was always, I don't know, I think the song was kind of like that, do you know what I mean? At the end of the day. Two of Britain's most popular pop groups have begun the biggest chart war in 30 years. The Manchester band Oasis and their arch-rivals Blur released new singles today, each hoping to reach the number one spot next week. The music industry hasn't seen anything like it since the Beatles fought it out with the Rolling Stones in the 60s. The enemy wanted to stoke the fires of a war between Blur and Oasis and stand back and see who survived. Um, Blur fell for it a bit too much. I don't think Oasis were too worried by it. And I think everybody at the NME wanted Blur to win that war because it was a nice, you know, they were nice middle class boys and the NME was an Oxbridge paper. Um, they were a bit annoyed when the working class oiks from Manchester won out. And there was that whole nonsense between you and Oasis. I mean, how did that all come about? Uh, I don't think we need to talk about that. Okay, that's fine. Just because uh, everyone knows about that, you know. But I mean, for you, that must have been, you know. I, I'm, not, I'm not going to tell you the real reason why. All right. Because, uh, you know, there are other people involved, and uh, the real reason why we fell out so kind of uh, uh, sort of publicly. It's been described as the British heavyweight pop music championship. In one corner, four young middle-class men from the south of England, collectively known as Blur, and in the other corner, five young working-class men from Manchester, called Oasis. They're the two most popular bands in Britain, having sold millions of records, and they're currently engaged in a chart war that set the music industry alight. We are now in the golden era again of British pop music. But these are two groups, Oasis and Blur, who actually formed on the indie circuit, who have, who have grown more and more popular through just playing lots and lots of gigs around the country, and who have now crossed right over to the, to the public at large, and they're duking it out to see who is the biggest. The way I see it is Steve Sutherland saying to Damon Alban, you should have released a single on the same day as them, we'll sell a shitload of papers and you'll sell a shitload of records. That's the way I see it. I was, we were quite offended at the time. We were sat in Rockfield and Alan McGee came down and said, well, they've moved their single back. You know, they had it ready to go like two weeks before and they decided to stop it and move it back so it was on the same day as ours. And um, Alan McGee and that was saying, well, you know, just like move yours back again. And we were saying, no, fuck that, you know. So... It was a chance, it was their last chance, really, to drag themselves up on the coattails of my band, really. And, you know, the enemy 
losing readers by the thousands every week. Um, I suppose it was something that they didn't think would get us out of hand as it did. But then again, you get Damon Alburn on the 10 o'clock news, you know. I ask you, what the fuck is all that about, you know? When the record shop doors opened this morning, battle commenced. The chances are both singles could have been number one had they been released on separate weeks. I'm a little nervous about the whole thing, um, obviously, because um, both bands have really upped the stakes and uh, someone's going to come out on top and someone's going to come out second. And, you know, by the very nature of being in a band, you're always quite competitive and um, you want to come top, really. Now, I found myself on the news at 10 in this kind of battle supposed battle all really odd because <laughs> you were saying to me last time we met that you know when you were you know just walking around in the street you were getting heckled yeah but also cheered as well I don't think it's kind of I don't want to cast myself as like you know poop, you know poor little Damon and everyone started picking on him it's really like that but it it was quite a bit unnerving on occasions I mean uh, everywhere I went I'd be reminded of it Blur didn't come out of it too well they were kind of the middle class band and you guys were the working class heroes well I wouldn't say Blur didn't come out of it well but that, that's what they are and that's what we are you can't you know you can't don't dress it up and make it something that it's not. You know, they've never been on a building site. Not to say that that's... You know, not to say that the dirt under your fingernails is some sort of badge of honour. You know, it's not. It's just a fact, you know. They never had a paper round. You know, I had a milk round and stuff like that, you know. Um, I worked on building sites. That fundamentally makes my soul a lot more purer than theirs. The strange thing about it is that you were... It, you were suddenly blur with a sort of inauthentic middle class mm. pop band and Oasis with a real gritty working class heroes. Mm. How did you feel about all that? That was very intelligent observation by whoever made that, wasn't it? What do I think about it? Yeah, I mean, well, how did you feel? I mean, that whole time... I mean, how did what... I feel? I felt stupid and I felt... Uh... I just felt very confused, basically. I didn't really realise that my kind of flippant C was going to have such, um, you know, profound sort of resonance in my life. And um, I changed quite dramatically after that period. understand why it cut the band suddenly became the barometer for the whole music scene for us and for other bands who were not at all interested it became maybe a little more difficult to sort of like make your presence felt because you had to have this kind of you had to be part of this this great sort of um this battle almost to take sides you know what i mean and you weren't interested in the fucking first place you know so you just got on with it and just wait for it to sort of abate for us and for other bands who were living in bristol I think in the last 10 years, the most creative time, you know, of, of our lives, really. Done a dirt of broken this 
baskets are Oh, we don't look the same as you And we don't do the things you do But we live round here too, oh really Misshapes, mistakes, misfits We like to go to town but we... Around that time, it, it seemed like something was happening. It was exciting for me because it seemed like there'd been this long, you know, long period of time when um, things from the kind of world that I was from were considered very marginal or whatever. Well, a lot of people were considered marginal because, there were, you know, if you lived on the dole in the kind of mid to late 80s, you were just scum of the earth, weren't you? And uh, I suppose it was on the back of Thatcher's Britain, so you were kind of used to being this kind of marginal piece of turd. And then suddenly, piece of turd became, was moved into centre stage. So that sounded, that felt exciting, it felt like a revolution was in progress or something. described as the perfect encapsulation of the Britpop aesthetic. No oh dear. <laughs> right. Wanna sleep with common people. I wanna sleep with common people like you. There's only a real story that had happened when I was at art college and this Greek girl did say she wanted to move to Hackney actually and live like the common people. And me saying that that couldn't happen because she could live in those circumstances, but she would just be acting a role because she knew that she could always escape from it. So it started there. I said, pretend you got no money. And she just laughed and said, are oh, you so funny? I said, yeah. I can't see anyone else smiling here. You wanna live like common people You wanna see whatever common people see Wanna sleep with common people You wanna sleep with common people like me Working class culture was often sneered at as being crude and stuff like that and then suddenly people maybe cottoned on to the fact that it was a bit more alive than the supposedly highbrow culture and so were desperate to say they'd been hanging around with some, you know, I, I went to a, a great calf. It was really, you know, authentic. You should have seen the cutlery was so dirty. It's not a choice that's made for you. You don't, like, sort of leave school and go, it's important that, I, it's important that I'm working class, you know, because that's just the way that I was born. I was born into a fucking life of menial fucking jobs. My dad was a labourer. My mum was a cleaner and a dinner lady. Um, and that was it, you know. What aspirations did we have? None, you know. Oh, we had was rock and roll. It was an explosion, wasn't yeah. it? It was, it was quite mad. And like I say, you know, they got that big that... Every pub you went in or whatever, or where's yeah. James were on? Well, every every box, venue well, in know. England, all of a sudden, you know, when you get that big, there wasn't any. So you'll get three gigs in the country out of Oasis. That's where we fill in all the gaps because they couldn't get to see them. So when did Wonderwall start? Uh, six nine, year. Six year ago. Six, were it? Something like that. It's a long time ago. Six years now. Some fucking miles, aren't we? On road and that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A long time. We had a we had a mad couple of years when uh, Don't Look Back and all that were released. It would. 
It so was it's fucking unbelievable. Probably busier than Oasis was. Today is gonna be the day that they're gonna throw it back to you. By now you should have somehow realized what you gotta do. I don't believe that any. What's a wonder wall, Dave? I was supposed to be about his bird, the song, wasn't it? Meg Matthews at the time, he wrote it for her, didn't well, he? Wall face. And she went, what? <laughs> Fucking hell does that mean? <laughs> you said I've got a face like a wall. I'm sure you've heard it all before, but you never really had a doubt. I don't believe that anybody feels the way I do about you now. When Morning Glory came out, it got universally slated by the British press. And then it went on, you know, to do whatever it done. It was just madness. We sold more singles than people sold albums. You know. I think Don't Look Back in Anger sold well over a million singles. I personally think Definitely Maybe is a far better album. And for the life of me, I can't understand why in this country in particular, that when people were going to buy Morning Glory, they didn't... I definitely maybe, and I'd just like to say, where do you fucking get off on that? Well, you know, when you go to HMV to buy a copy of Morning Glory, you don't buy definitely maybe. What's that all about? You know, do you just do it to piss me off? I, I would... It's a source of... I could sit and think about that for hours. Have you got definitely maybe? And Morning Glory... See, no, I can, yeah, I can understand that. People are fucking weird. Maybe... Are you gonna be the one that saves me? And after all, you're my wonder wall. I stood at Nebworth and watched Oasis. I turned to Alan McGee and said, "This is it. This is the, the battle has been won." And, and it seemed that throughout that time in the eighties, when we were putting on bands in in little clubs or doing fanzines or doing flexi discs or records or just trying to get an article about a small band on on the radio, on a, an article on a on a small band in, in in the music press or what have you, it seemed like everything that had been done was was finalised at Nebworth. That's what it felt like. He was the greatest band in the world, the biggest band in the world, and for once the biggest band in the world were the best band in the world. I think everything, they got to a certain point in after Morning Glory come out and Wonderwall took off, that it, it felt that everything was leading up to something that was going to define uh, not only the size of, of the band, but what British pop music was about at that time. So it, it all felt like it was leading to Nebworth. But, you know, we were too busy, I think we were too busy doing it to worry about, because I thought, I think if we'd have, if we'd have sat down and calculated that we were going to make history, we'd have, you know, we'd have, I'd have certainly wore a better outfit, let's put it that way, and I may have gone to bed a little bit earlier, and we may have tried to keep Liam off the sauce. This one's for our, yeah, this one's for our, anyone. Now I've left to that crown, fuck he's Biggest freestanding gig in mm. history. 
very proud of that. Do you remember of that time? Nothing. Not a lot, really. I remember forgetting that it was like, I thought we were only doing one night. And then we'd done the second, so I got really drunk after the first night. And can't remember anything else. Today's gonna be the day that they're gonna throw it back to you. By now you should have somehow realized what you're not to do. I don't believe that anybody feels the way I do about you now. What are the characteristics that make a great rock band? Having it, just having it. I don't know what it is, you just got to have it and I've got it. And by us having it, hopefully some other people will learn how to have it. You know what I mean? Enjoy the celebrity. At the beginning, of course, yeah. I loved all that at the beginning, meeting people you'd only seen on telly. And, um, you know, supermodels and all that stuff and actors and all that. Yeah, you know, meeting you and McGregor and all that for the first time was fucking ace. Oh. 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 Danny Ball did a very clever thing and he sort of brought all the kind of Britpop luminaries and whoever in and asked them all to do songs for it and we just kind of did it and it was, uh, it was, it was cool, it was good fun. There was a whole wave of creativity that came off the streets and surprised people you know, they were making Hollywood movies about tales of smack addiction in tenements in Glasgow. What was all that about? Oh, I had a fucking great time. And um, every single day between 1994, spring 94 and spring 97, there was something of ex there was some excitement. I mean, really, we used to row at Loaded about whose turn it was to do the 100 yards to go and get the champagne. I used to really enjoy going out and, like, going to openings and then, you know, going out and getting, you know, being in a suit one minute and then on your knees the next look like a fucking tramp and being surrounded constantly, having people going, oh, he's lost it. Oh, no, he's looking really together. Oh, no, he's lost it. And in a way that, I don't know, I mean, there's a lot of enjoyment out of something like that. For a while, we all had a lot of fun. I certainly did. There was a kind of cultural change. It was all right to be a, a lad. Yeah, but it's like, <clears throat> I think it's like anything like that. Because it had been so beyond the pale to be like that for a long time, it was kind of a breath of fresh air when... People just were quite crude. One of the odder things about this whole twinning of Britpop with lad culture um, is the fact that um, people were scared to talk about what it actually is that makes a rock star. An example of this is Liam Gallagher, who at various points, looked quite androgynous. What does that mean? You have a feminine quality about you as well. I have a what? Feminine quality about you. What does that mean? Well, you're not just some, you know... I'm a bird. <laughs> no, I'm not saying you're a bird. What does that mean? Well, it's like you're not, you know, some 15 stone hole. What? You, know, you, have, <laughs> you have that kind of androgynous. It's a kind of, you've got... You've got a bit of feminine in your masculinity. Have I? Explain. How does that mean? Well, I suppose just in your looks. I'm a pretty boy, yeah. Yeah, I'm pretty good looking. I take care of my hair. 
bit obsessed with my hair. It's got to be, you've got to have a decent haircut if you're the front man of a band, you know what I mean? Hey, man. A lot of the people were very ambivalent about being in Vanity Fair in connection with Cool Britannia. Yet on the other hand, they kind of did want to be in Vanity Fair. It was as though if something hasn't been noticed by the American media, particularly New York glossy magazines, it's as though it hasn't really happened. So even though Cool Britannia was this kind of, was this sort of violent reaction um, to things precisely like Vanity Fair and their enormous influence, saying, we don't care what you think, we're British, we don't care about America. But at the same time, they wanted to be, they wanted to be photographed, they wanted to appear in the magazine. Well, one of the, one of the touch and go people uh, for a very long time was Tony Blair. Uh, one of my jobs was trying to persuade people in Tony Blair's office uh, that it would be a good thing politically for Tony Blair to pose in the Vanity Fair Cool Britannia issue. And um, that was extremely tough because on the one hand, the whole cultural phenomenon had occurred under John Major's premiership. So in a sense, the Tories could take credit for Cool Britannia. So why should Tony Blair in any way endorse it? Um, but on the other hand, Cool Britannia did seem to be a harbinger of a kind of new mood in Britain, a new optimism. And that was very much something Tony Blair hoped to sort of uh, catch the coattails of in the 97 general election. like an absolute fucking idiot. And, uh, cause they wanted me and Liam to do it. And I remember taking the phone call and somebody saying, well, if you don't do it, Blair will do it. So I laughed and handed the phone to Liam. I was like, oh, well, fuck. Oh, well, I'd better do it then, you know what I mean? And uh, yeah, and Liam ends up on the cover with a nipple on his head looking like a fucking baby's bottle with his fucking missus in a Union Jack bed, that's the one, topless, ooh. Um, rubbish. Come and play the tunes of glory Raise your voice in celebration Of the days that we have wasted In the cafe, in the station And learn the meaning of existence In fortnightly installments Come share this golden age Tony Blair was carried into Downing Street today on a political landslide and on a wave of Labour jubilation. He'd have a majority in the Commons of 179, Labour's best result ever. It so depressed me when Noel went to Downing Street and you see those pictures of him now, you see the, the news report and he's got his nice neat haircut and he's got his posh jacket on and Meg's bought herself a nice new dress and everything that he was about, they didn't belong to anybody. Suddenly he did. He was right in, in their pocket. And in that very instant, he was neutered. It was like someone had come along with a knife and just cut his bollocks off. I defy anybody to have an official fucking thing pop on their letterbox, you know, while you're dressed like an Afghan clown fucking at five in the morning, you know, off your fucking head on acid and going, it's from the fucking Prime Minister. It's from the Prime Minister. What does it say? He wants us to go around for a fucking... 
fucking he's inviting us to his house for a for a drink. Oh, we've got to go then. Fucking right, we've got to go. Were you invited to number 10 Downing Street? No. Nope. And I wouldn't have gone anyway. Why not? It's not my place to it's, Why would I go there? What have I, I've got nothing in common with any of them. Don't know anything about politics. Don't want to. Looks like a shit house anyway, so why go there? Why do you think no one? Because he's fucking mad for it, isn't he? He's wanted to get in there and have a little nosy about. And part of you goes, right, yeah, I'd have gone just to have a look around like what Noel did. And part of you goes, right, I won't go because it's not my cup of tea. And then part of you goes, well, fuck that, I don't want to go out tonight. I'm going to stay in. Why didn't I go? Um, because it just, I just realised that we'd all been taken for a ride and that, you know, everyone would be dropped. Uh, you know, there's kind of sort of the promise of... Well, OK, put it this way. Maybe I was just uh, delusional, but I'd been given the impression that um, I was asked there because they had an interest in what I had to say. Um, but by the point that they got into power, it was pretty evident to me that us lot, i.e. the artists and the entertainers, <clears throat> were, um, you know... Basically, if we got, you know, if you went there, you were going to go through the front door and then just be shown the exit as soon as you got in, and as long as it, it all got on, um, it all got on telly and in the papers, that was all that mattered. And then it was like, uh, now we were in the country, fuck off. I've never had good feelings about Tony Blair or New Labour, um, and it's interesting. It was a measure of how conservative the music business and the music press was at the time. You absolutely couldn't say that without getting slapped. I mean, literally, you could not criticise New Labour, you could not criticise Blair. It was, you know, verboten, it was not allowed. Um, so desperate was everyone to believe in the con that it was. What really pissed me off was um, when I kind of made a comment about I didn't really understand or I didn't really feel he could justify sending his kids to private school. Or grant funded, sorry. That's a euphemism. Um, and I got a letter from his office saying, don't talk about that. And that was really the end, you know, of my kind of uh, brief flirtation with, uh, you know. Which is why when they got in and there was this five minutes of thanking everyone who helped promote him, I didn't really feel like I was part of the party. <laughs> Um, but you know, you can get these, you can get these CDs nowadays where they sort of you know, yeah. play along with them. We'd set up to watch the election all night. And I asked him how he managed to stay up all night. And he went into me and he said, Probably not by the same means you did. And at that point, I thought, You fucking smart ass. And he's right, you know. Um, I thought that was hilarious. I had a lot of respect for him after that. Um, but they, there you go. The photograph looks a bit shit, though, doesn't it? I got the fear. Uh, that's true. Uh, well, because I got what I wanted, I suppose, what I'd been uh, after for uh, for the mo for the majority of my life, and then the actual reality of that I thought was rubbish. It's Saturday night, and we're about to discover who's got stars in their eyes. 
He's a bright boy turned home star because tonight, seen live, Gareth Dickinson is Jarvis Cocker. Yeah, or you just you just realise that you've become a nomad. It was like you've lived, you know, I don't know how old I was, 32 or something. So you've lived your life up to a certain point for 30 years and then suddenly all that experience and, and life that you've led seems to not count for anything anymore because you can't do them things anymore because you've got all these people going, yeah, at you. So, so uh, and yet the world that supposedly has now opened its doors to you. Yes, welcome, sir. Welcome to the Celebrity Club. It just seems to be really shite. Uh, uh, so my way of dealing with that situation was just to get as hammered as possible. Biff Avery, screen test, take two. I didn't take her to the motel, she took me. I'll tell you the unwritten law, you dumb son of a bitch. Hey, I went to college once, but all they found were rats in my head. Did you find this is hardcore, the album, a struggle to write? To this is together? hardcore, yeah, it was awful. And it was the, probably definitely the worst period of my life. Without question. I mean, really. Because I was just a mess. Why? Um. Well, I mean, taking drugs didn't help. That, that never helps in the situation, you know. You don't often hear people saying, oh, oh, since he's been taking them drugs, he's such a nice person. He's, re he's really come out of his shell, he's really nice. He's blossomed. That was Damon's accurate line of the 90s. There was a blizzard going on. It just became the accessory. And um, for me, running loaded the the toilet became the new golf course. It was where all the deals were being done. The amount of features that I got out for the magazine from sitting, you know, chopping stuff out of a table or a toilet or a... Oh, yeah, I'll be in it, no problem. Have another line. It's another English sort of classic English cue, you know? Another great, the cocaine cue. substance? Well, all around that time was people taking loads of coke, you know. Coke suddenly did become, I mean, suddenly huge and very readily available everywhere. Mm. Well, it's a very self-congratulatory kind of a drug, you know. <gasps> yes, we're inventing the future. Just get now. Mid-90s was um, a very up time, but uh, I don't think really anyone was thinking about the consequences of it, you know, and the government as well, I think, uh, got carried away. It was just, my God, we've got to change, changing climate. It's become an urban myth, but a lot of people say that song, Be The Bums, about heroin. I don't know, is, is the last song, There She Goes, about heroin? Does it matter? Does it matter? I mean... Obviously, whoever, heads and shoulders, whoever it was who used it on their advert didn't think so. I 
hit that point where I didn't feel like nothing could hurt me. And I think once you start to feel a bit more vulnerable, your outlook changes. Today was the day Oasis fans at last got their hands on the group's new album, Be Here Now. It's their first for two years. And as the Gallagher brothers might have put it themselves, the fans were mad for it. It's just something you can tell your grandchildren, isn't it? I mean, the biggest album of all time. Yeah. I mean, I was there first. When you heard the first few tracks, but from what I hear, it's going to be wicked, better, much better than the first two albums. It's the best one yet. I think it's the best album of this year. And I don't think, I don't even think I just want to have any better than this ever. It's that good. No, I don't like the album. <laughs> Why don't you like the album? It's just the same old stuff. It's like, you know, guitar rock, dad rock, all the same. It's the sound of a bunch of guys on coke, in the studio, not giving a fuck. There's no bass to it at all. I don't know what, what happened to that. It's all... And all the songs are really long and all the lyrics are shit. And for every millisecond Liam is not saying a word, there's a fucking guitar riff in there in a Wayne's World style you know. Fucking air guitar gone mental. But um, Liam, thinks, Liam thinks it fucking rocks. At that time, we thought it was fucking great and I still think it's great. It just wasn't morning glory and I'm sick of these people going on about definitely maybe, fuck definitely maybe. It's over, you know. Fuck morning glory, it's over. People can, people will bitch about it for the rest of their lives, you know. But, you know, fucking sell it. You get four or five quid for it, I would imagine. Come round to my house, I'll sign it for you. Probably get a tenner then. I thought it were all right, actually. I thought there were some great tracks on it, I did, yeah. But it were hyped up that much that they couldn't live up to what, what everyone were expecting them to do. It, it ruins them. It ruins people, that. Now they're analysed because every track isn't a number one. Yeah. Which isn't fair because it, I look at them and think, well, you're not gonna get, they're not going to get a chance, are they? What are you doing now? Opening this. <sighs> Fucking hell, that's why you know, he has a Liam bib him as well. <laughs> the end of Britpop was, if nothing else, was that Oasis third album, Be Here Now which actually isn't the great disaster that everybody says. Um, it's about, there are two or three really good songs on it, but it was supposed to be the big, big triumphal record. Labour got in, Oasis are preparing their big statement, and it comes out three or four days before Princess Di gets killed. The whole, the whole Britpop thing died quite quickly and it left a, a huge gulf and there was like a, a vacuum there that needed to be filled. And what happens with the music business, it has a default setting and its default setting is pop music. And luckily for the music industry, that Robbie Williams was there to fill it. I sit and wait as an angel Contemplate my fate We were recording our last album and Robbie was recording his first um, in the studio next door. Elton John was taking him to rehab the next day and for whatever reason he wanted like a, an indie band to come and listen to uh, this record that he'd made and he sort of dragged the whole band in to listen to his recording of Angels and he said that he thought it was a, an 11 out of 10, uh, which it was. Um, and you sort of knew that this was kind of going to be the new force. Like Robbie Williams making music kind of like Oasis. So once he was doing it, you knew it was over. That was the moment that it was finished. And through it, oh, she offers me protection. A lot of love and affection. Whether I'm right or wrong. And down the waterfall, wherever it may take me. I know that life won't break me. 
comes to call She won't forsake me I'm loving angels instead So Britain culturally at the moment, you know, what, what do you think it is? What kind of place it is to live at the moment? So I mean, it'd be easy to say it's very American, but I don't think it's quite true. You know, we've obviously kind of changed a lot in the last sort of 15, 20 years. Um, I find it a, quite an anonymous place at the moment. You know, city to city, I don't find, I don't feel when I go to a place that I feel a lot of that place anymore. It feels that there's an overall feeling of Britain, which is everything is quite uniform. Everywhere you go, everything's in the same place all the sounds are the same everything's become so pop on one level and so uh, and so kind of uh, calculated which has, has worked you know in certain areas of the music business obviously because it's been going there for a good six seven years this whole kind of karaoke build your own band thing We were mixing the Hindu Times in Olympic Studios in London. And where, where the room is where we're doing this mixing is like a, a conservatory type thing. And there was all these kids doing their fucking dancing thing. And, I, and Liam and Andy Bell walked in. And I went, you see all them kids out there? And he went, oh, you mean Junior S Club 7? And it took me 20 minutes to realise, how the fuck do you know what they're called? I thought they were just some kids from a special needs school who was hanging out in a fucking recording studio for the day because it was free food or something, you know. And they knew their names. I don't mind us club juniors, they're all right. They're better than the fucking other ones. Good little kids, man. And where did all this come from? Have you ever noticed now when these fucking knobheads from Pop Idol, it's like all the, the boy bands or the girl bands, what does this mean? You know, what, I, don't, I don't get that at all. All the, the choreographers have taken over the world, man. You know, everything's choreographed now, isn't it? It's fucking rubbish. <laughs> I was in LA a few weeks ago and I was in a restaurant and Simon Fuller, who is the one of the conspirators behind Pop Idol, came up to me and I said, Oh, hello. All right. Lovely to meet you. Uh, and he said, I said, Well, what are you doing? And he said, Oh, well, we're just uh, finalising our deals to uh, bring Pop Idol to America. And I went, Oh, great. That's really good news. <laughs> so I mean, we, we know, you know, I suppose we've got to give them, give them something, haven't they? They're kind of given us a heck of a lot. It's just rock and roll. 